I am Giovanni Johnny Ceruti, and I am very excited to have my friend, Pastor Steve Wahlberg of Whitehorse Media on again. Steve Wahlberg on. And anytime that Steve reaches out and says, I would like to discuss anything, anything, and see if it's I'd like to discuss, done. Done. It's it's always very fulfilling. And honestly, as far as I'm concerned, we can never hit. Let me take my watermark off there. We can never. We can never hit this issue, this topic, too often because, sorry for all the earthquake vibrations there, as Christians, let me think of where to start here, you live, you live in disinformation, you live in a sea of lies, and it's deeply disturbing to realize that the sea of lies has been created by our enemy. People have criticized me. I know they've criticized Steve and and others, the, the few like us. Come on, Johnny, stop being so mean to the to the Vatican. Just preach the love of Jesus. Does it make any sense to point to the mansion that Christ is making for us with the individual rooms that has making for us? Say, just look at that mansion over there. Just walk towards that mansion. And you'll be fine. Don't worry about the landmines, the moat, the punchy stakes, the crocodiles, uh, the barbed wire, the snipers, all of those traps that will stop you from getting to the mansion in a very strong metaphorical sense. Focus on Jesus and ignore the lies and disinformation so that you are the seed that gets thrown on rocky soil. And you have no purchase. I would say that to understand these dangers, the relationship with Christ, knowledge of the Antichrist is so close as to be almost indiscernible in its importance. And then when you step back and I look, I, I am not uh, sectarian. I am not sectarian. I am me and Jesus Christ. And I adore Steve Wahlberg a uh, passionate, zealous pastor of Seventh-day Adventist Church because of how much he gets right that so many other pastors get wrong. And I, and I submit to you, there's been some great information on this. That's by design. Fantastic, a, a must-watch documentary, many decades old, by the late James Arabito, Jim Arabito, called Behind the Door, on Jesuit infiltration just of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I promise you, as a, a, a shocking as Jim's information was there, it is across the board. Not just other, other Christian churches, other Christian sects, but even other sister orders within the Catholic Church, Dominicans, Franciscans, all taken over by the Jesuits and controlled. So that, Christian pastors, evangelical Christian Protestant pastors now teach Jesuit heretical eschatology, futurism, praetorism, the idea that we don't know who the Antichrist is somewhere down the road. He'll appear, he'll pop up out of nowhere, and he'll sign a contract with uh, Israel. Israel will still exist, Israel, a political nation. And then halfway through, he'll break the contract. All that is a misreading of Daniel. Praetorism, another Jesuit idea, uh, Alcazar, Ribera, Jesuits, even, even, and I don't mean to monopolize our, our, our prelude, but, but even a, a discredited prejudice source like Wikipedia will tell you futurism and praetorism were, were created by Jesuits to distract Christianity. 95 to 98% of evangelical fundamental Christian Protestant pastors teach Jesuit heresy, which is why when my dear friend Steve Wahlberg says, let's talk about Revelation, done, done. Love you, Stephen. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Johnny. Appreciate uh, your support. And I tell you, Johnny, uh, people really like our our interviews. Uh, the last one that we did uh, on, I believe it was on the seven heads, the first part or part of Revelation 17, we've had at least at this moment, I think we have over 7,000 views. 
uh, people and just lots of comments. People have just really appreciated the dialogue that we have, the back and forth, the honesty, uh, and how a lot of it's just unscripted and we're just tackling and going verse by verse through the prophecies. And, and it's just to second what you've said. It is shocking to me to, uh, to watch some evangelical videos and, and watch them on social media talking about Israel and the Antichrist and the rebuilt temple and the rapture. And, and they're just convinced that Antichrist is, is coming. It's going to be this uh, super bad dude, this super bad guy that's going to show up during the tribulation after the church disappears. And, uh, and it just, it boggles my mind, Johnny, how, how blind people can be to 500 years of history. Uh, and, and even beyond that, you know, going all the way back to the time of Constantine, the history of the rise of the beast, uh, the persecutions that took place during the Dark Ages, the Inquisition, the Reformation, uh, the, the Protestant reformers who many were burned at the stake, who lost their lives because they took a stand against the papal power. They knew who the woman was in Revelation 17, the harlot. Uh, they knew who the beast was. They understood that this power was not coming after the rapture. This power was right in front of them, uh, doing exactly what Bible prophecy predicted that this power would do. And, and yet people have just been, they've been uh, shifted away from historical, biblical, solid, Christ-centered, Protestant truth, and now they're getting they're involved in fantasy and illusion and novels and uh, speculation about some future Antichrist coming, and they don't realize that the beast has been around, walking around, snarling, persecuting for a long time. And and as you know, White Horse Media, our ministry. Uh, has made it a major focus of our ministry to teach prophecy and to teach uh, history and to sh- and to reveal these facts and then and then of course at the heart of our our ministry is lifting up Jesus because that's what the Reformation was all about was getting people away from Antichrist and focusing their minds on Jesus Christ the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world uh, through whom we are saved uh, by grace. <clears throat> through his cross and through his merits and his righteousness and and his love for us so we don't have to go to the priest we don't have to confess uh to men we don't have to do works of penance we don't have to you know pray all these prayers to mary and the saints and all these things which are just delusional uh we need jesus and we need bible truth and as we have discussed these topics many times uh, one of the big uh, focuses of of our interviews has been Revelation 17. And so I want to go uh, farther in Revelation 17 and focus on those those ten horns and uh, the last few verses of chapter 17, which bring us down to the closing issues at the end of time, which are just, they're they're monumental, and we need to understand what these issues are. Amen. Well, I, I I know I walk with Christ. You walk with Christ, and I I don't need a special prayer moment, but we'll we'll uh, beseech the Lord in prayer anyway, because there's more than just you and I going on here. There's That's our right. desire to uh, educate the audience, and we always need the Holy Spirit for that. So um, I'll <laughs> I'll just open up and turn it over to you. Thank you. Lord Jesus yep. Christ, I'm deep, deeply grateful for another opportunity to share your truth with my with my friend Steve. I'm deep, deeply grateful for you putting us together, and I just ask that you forgive me of my many shortcomings and the many ways that I've failed you. Please don't let that be an impediment to what we're trying to do here today. It's always with the deepest love and intimacy that I choose to please you so that I can be told when it's my time, well done, good and faithful servant. Um, Steve, anything on your on your mind? Uh, Father, I add my prayer. Thank you that uh, Johnny and I can connect again, and we pray together in Jesus' name for the Holy Spirit to work through both of us and to enlighten those who are going to be watching uh, th- this uh, this interview or this this dialogue, this Bible study. Lord, may light 
from your word shine forth from the two of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Um, real, real quick, I'll tell you, Steve, what, what you had said. I was writing notes as you were speaking because you were making me think of some things. You know, um, granted that seminaries, this idea that you have to go through a set curriculum in order to learn how to pre- pastor, shepherd, and preach, uh, all of that comes from the Catholic Church. This idea of uh, public education, mandatory education, an educational route for expertise for a doctor, whether it's a um, theological doctor or doctor of medicine, that comes from the Latin docere, which is to propagandize, where we get the word indoctrinate. As bad as seminaries are, seminary, what does a seminary do? Seminary pops out a priest. Why, why is my pastor going through a seminary? As bad as they are, there are people that do this for a living that I there's no way, Steve, there's no way. And not to name names, but I'm going to name names. Guys, across the board, my, in, in, in my time and previous times, John MacArthur, Jim Dobson, um, D. James Kennedy, one of my favorites going up, Charles Stanley, all of these guys that are hugely popular, Billy Graham especially, These are guys that there's no way they spent their lives, decades, preaching the gospel, and they've never heard of the Reformation. They've never heard of the Inquisition. They've never read Fox's Book of Martyrs that are volumes. Now, granted, I've heard uh, um, uh, plausible accusations that the Vatican has taken over publication of Fox's and watered it down, even watered down their blood curdling, the idea that a a child is, is reciting the Lord's Prayer, and, and, and a, a priest goes, where did you get that? And the child accidentally outs their family, and the entire family gets burned alive. That Fox's Book of Martyrs. You've never read that? You've never read uh, you, you never read how Luther, Calvin, Knox, Wingley, uh, guys were put to the, to the death, to the stake. Um, uh, Rogers, Cromwell, uh, Wycliffe wasn't, but uh, Jan Hus was. Men who love Jesus Christ and were were tortured to death by the Catholic Church, and you've never heard of that? You dis- Not a single word from these huge names? They're in collusion. They're in collusion. And Ezekiel 33, the watchman, the compact of the watchman on the wall, says, when you are judged, when you stand before Jesus Christ, and you saw that danger to my flock and my people, and you kept your mouth shut so that you could have a personal gain, the harm that is done, the blood of my beloved children that is spilled, that's on your head. That's on your head. Jim Dobson, uh, 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 who, who else? Um, uh, Saddleback Church. Um, Rick Warren. Thank you. Thank you, Rick Warren. Greg Laurie, Chuck Smith. I came to Christ at Calvary Chapel. Came to Christ at Calvary Chapel. And these, these are uh, uh, both pastors and institutions that are deep in bed. Uh, Jesus Revolution, they got a devout Roman Catholic to portray Lonnie Frisbee, the very flawed Lonnie Frisbee, who is, uh, also portrays Jesus and, and other. Uh, and it shows you in Jesus Revolution how Greg Laurie got his start preaching at a Jesuit church. That's that's by design, Pastor Steve. That's by design. So, yeah. So, Johnny, let's let's uh, put some prophetic teeth behind all of this. Uh, let's look at Revelation seventeen, and let me just read the verses that I want to discuss. Uh, let's start with verse eleven, Revelation seventeen eleven. I'm going to pull up my greens. I'm just going to, and I'm just going to read this to the end of the chapter and so people can get the uh you know the impact of these verses and then we'll discuss them uh verse 11 revelation 17 11 says and the beast which that was and is not even he is the eighth and he is of the seven and he goes into perdition okay i'll let you get that down there okay yeah so that was verse 11 verse 12 says and the ten horns that you saw They are 10 kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but will receive authority as kings one hour with the beast. Verse 13, they have one mind and their 
and their power and authority they shall give up to the beast. These will make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, because he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and the ones with him are the called and elect and faithful ones. And he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and crowds and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot and will make her desolate and naked, and they will eat her flesh and burn her down with fire. For God gave into their hearts to do his mind and to act in one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is the great city, having a kingdom over the kings of the earth. So you can just feel the weight of those verses. Uh, And this chapter, as we've talked about, has been uh, interpreted in so many ways. But what we've been doing, and we've I think we've gone through all of the former verses in in different interviews together, and we've made it very, very clear uh, from ver- a verse by verse study in the light of history and the Protestant Reformation and the facts that this woman riding the beast is a symbol of the of the Roman Catholic Church system. Uh, we've made that very clear, and we've just you know been trying to put these pieces together. And so, Steve, me, uh, Scripture makes that very clear. I don't know how you can have any uh, familiarity with Revelation 17. The great harlot drunk on the blood of the saints, clothed in scarlet and purple. And if in any way you walk away and you're not just overwhelmed with how much that's the Catholic Church, then you have divine blotters. You have scales over your eyes. Right. She sits on seven hills, which is the seven-hilled city of Rome. Her colors are purple and scarlet, which is the color of the cardinals. She fornicates with kings, uh, which is exactly what Rome has done for over 1,500 years. She's drunk through to this day, Steve. Paint. Through to this day. I don't mean to step on it, but through to this day. They get, and I have, I have information from a, a, uh, a Chinese real estate agent, billionaire, Gao Wengui, that said that and I can bring that up, but I don't want to take your time away. Gao Wengui said that the terrible tyranny of communist China, the communist Chinese government, pay $2 billion a year in Peter's Pence. Peter's Pence, centuries-old tradition of sending tribute to the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy. To this day, today, right now, the communist Chinese government send $2 billion billion dollars a year in Peter's Pence tribute to the papacy to the Vatican. Why? Because the, the, if the Vatican at any point tells the millions of Catholic Chinese that they are no longer loyal to their government, the way they've threatened throughout all of history, uh, Catholic kings and queens, you will do what the Pope says, or you will be excommunicated. So what? Excommunicate me. Now I will tell my subjects they no longer need to be loyal to you, and you'll have an assassin cleaning your toilets or fixing your food for you, and you'll never see it coming. That scares them, and they will do whatever the papacy says. I mean, I step on you, but... And, and, th- and that contributes to the wealth that we see in this chapter. The woman, it says, she's decked with gold, precious stones, and pearls. She's very wealthy. She's the mother church, which only applies to the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, You just look at all the details. She makes the whole world drunk with her wine, which is her false doctrines. Uh, She has support from people around the world. The waters, the angel said, are people, multitudes, nations, and tongues that support this woman. So you just look at all the facts it doesn't apply to anybody else. It doesn't apply to America. It doesn't apply to uh, pagan Rome, because uh, it also says in Revelation 18, 4, come out of her, my people. God has his own people inside of her that need to come out before the judgments fall. So they're all the evidence, the cumulative evidence is very, very clear that uh, the, the woman riding this beast is a symbol of the Roman Catholic Church, the mother, the mother of harlots. Amen. Steve, if I can just real quickly give the wine of her doctrines, just a summary, quick summary of the wine of her doctrines. Pre-tribulation rapture, futurism, Jesuit priest Manuel de la Cunza, pretending to be a Jew and personating a Jewish rabbi named Juan Yehoshaphat ben Ezra, writing the book, The Coming of the Messiah and Glory and Majesty. This was taken by occultist Margaret MacDonald uh, and given to John Nelson Darby. Praetorism, the idea that prophecy is already fulfilled, Luis d'Alcazar, Jesuit. 
Um, futurism. Jesuit Francisco Ribera. Francis. They love to name their children Francis. Dispensationalism. The idea that uh, there's a separate clock. I remember, I remember when I was learning from people like Dr. Chuck Missler, who is now judged on behalf of Calvary Chapel, Chuck Missler using this metaphor of the, um, the chess clock. Uh, one opponent presses the chess clock down and he makes his move and then he presses the clock and the next opponent, dispensationalism, absolutely Jesuitical and heretically blasphemous. The idea that there are promises due to a bloodline over and above the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, do you realize what that means? Do you, do you understand that both Paul and Jesus Christ himself were replacement theologians? Um, and... Molinism, Molinism from Spanish Jesuit uh, Luis de Molina, the the idea that um, um, the error Molins used to be an argument against eternal damnation. Anyway, I just want to give a quick summary of the wine of her doctrines, the false doctrines. Ninety five percent of Protestant churches teach that from the pulpit today. Deeply absurd. Yeah, and, and and the list goes goes on and on. And since you mentioned Israel, Johnny, I just want to. Just want to mention, uh, I've got a book here called Israel and the End of the World that I teachings of Paul, the teachings of the book of Revelation, and what the Bible really says. And, and all this, and Johnny, we both know this, all of these different ideas are really acting as a, a smokescreen so that the real uh, Antichrist, the real beast, is not being detected. He's still in the shadows, and yet he's pulling the strings uh, and he's working around the world. So, uh, anyway, let's let's tackle the ten horns. Let's tackle these ten horns. I'm to show your book. There we go. Okay. Yeah, there it is. Israel and the end of the world: separating fact from fiction. Uh, available from from White Horse Media. And actually, it says single copies are 9.99 you can get this book for i think it's as low as 99 cents if you buy uh multiple copies the price goes way down and all the information is there on our website from whitehorse media now uh let, let let me just share i've got a stack of notes here or a paper of notes as i was thinking about this interview um he, he, this is where i want to start we know from revelation 17 that we have a woman and she's riding a beast that has seven heads and ten horns. Uh, we know from biblical prophecy that many times a single entity can be uh, represented by different symbols. And, and, the, and the perfect illustration of that is the lamb. The lamb in the book of Revelation is a symbol of Jesus. Very, very clear. Nobody would argue with that. And yet Jesus is not just represented by the symbol of a lamb. He's also represented by the symbol of a lion. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. So Jesus, two symbols, lamb, lion, they both apply to Christ. It's the same thing with the, the woman in Revelation 17. And we've done a lot of this study before. If you look at, we know, Daniel 7, he's represented as a little horn. In Daniel 8, the same power, the symbol changes, and it's called uh, a king of fierce countenance. In 2 Thessalonians 2, we have the same power, but now it's called the man of sin, right? In Revelation 13, verse 1, it's the same power, but it's called uh, the, the beast, the beast. And then in Revelation 17, it's the same power, but now it's called uh, the woman, the whore, the harlot. So we have little horn, king of fierce countenance, uh, man of sin, beast, and uh, the woman, the harlot. These are all different symbols that point to the same thing, right? That point to uh, the Roman Catholic Church system. And at least a Protestant wouldn't disagree with that, a real Protestant. And this is what uh, the Reformers understood when they taught the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. Okay, what do we got here, Johnny? Uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm just hoping to, to underline and highlight what you're saying. This is Pius XII, Eugenio Pacelli, who was so deeply involved with the Third Reich, he is erroneously called Hitler's Pope. It was the other way around. 
uh, Roman Catholic Adolf Hitler was his puppet. I just wanted to show as an example of yep. the the little horn that speaks great blasphemies. Yeah, it's he's a man because it's the man of sin because it's centered in a man, the Pope, the man of sin. Uh, it's a king of fierce countenance because the Pope not only claims to be a pastor, but he's also a monarch. He's the king of Vatican City. Uh, it's it's also a beast because it's it's a it's it functions in a ferocious way and it does the things that the beast uh, the beast does. It's also a woman because it's he's the head of a church claiming to be the church of Jesus. So God uses different symbols to point to the same power. Now, now here's the key point, Johnny. If I want to throw uh, this in real quick, Pastor, not to step on you, son of perdition, right? title for only two yes, individuals in right. Scripture, Antichrist and Judas Iscariot. What do they have in common? Betrayal. They pretended to love Jesus and instead betrayed him, exactly as Judas does, exactly as every single pope does, pretending to be the vicar of Christ, the conduit for Christ, and he betrays Christ. That's right. Uh, Judas was a false disciple of Jesus, and that is the epitome of Antichrist, uh, a false disciple of Christ, representing to be his follower and yet betraying him. Okay, now, when we get to Revelation 17, the same pattern, continue, same pattern continues. We have the Roman Catholic Church symbolized by a woman, and we also have the Roman Catholic Church symbolized by the beast, so two different symbols, just like lamb and lion, apply to Jesus. We now we have a woman and we have a beast. Two different symbols that apply to the same thing, and and we know this from from many different reasons. We we know for sure that the woman uh, applies to the Roman Catholic Church. And if you look at verse eleven, Revelation seventeen eleven, it says the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goes to perdition. And we talked about this before, that the beast ruled during the Dark Ages, but then it was wounded. It received a wound, right? A deadly wound as a result of the Protestant Reformation and as a result of the French uh, Revolution. So the beast was, during the Dark Ages, it, was, it lost its political power. That's why it is not. Uh, but it's going to come back. Uh, the, the, it will it will rise up and it will go into perdition and we're seeing that now. Now we haven't seen it fully. The prophecy still has more uh, steam ahead of it, but we know that there there will be a uh, a healing of the deadly wound. There will be a resurrection of the papal power and the papal power's influence in uh, in geopolitical affairs. So 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 again, we see the woman is the Catholic Church, the mother. But so is the beast who was wounded and is coming back again. So now, now here's Pastor, where I'm going. What you, a question for you real quick. What do you think about that beast um, also symbolizing the United States? Because certainly the Roman Catholic Church absolutely steers the terrible, devastating yeah. tyranny of the United States yeah, government. Good question. And let me, let me answer that in a little bit as we go a little bit farther and focused on Protestantism, which I'll get to. Now, let's go to look, look at Revelation 17, verse 15. Se I'm sorry, verse 5, 17, 5. 17, 5, if you want to put that Yes, up. sir, putting it up right now. Okay. Seventeen five. the Bible says, and upon her forehead, this is the whore, was a name written, a name having been written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of what? The mother of what? What is it? What's that word? Uh, here in the JP Green literal, it says the abominations of the earth. Okay, wait, but you. Mother you, of harlots. You, I'm sorry, the mother of harlots. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, the mother of harlots. Yeah, now let's look at the spelling of the and, word. And to harlot. me, the, that sexual impropriety always implies betrayal of Yahweh, of wandering from from Yahweh, harlotry. Yeah, and it also it also harlotry also involves. Yeah, she's she wanders from Yahweh, and she fornicates with the kings, right? The kings of the earth; those are her lovers. So it has to do with the church that has committed harlotry with 
uh, the state, with states, with kings, with governments, in order to enforce her doctrines. And that's and the history of, of Catholicism in, during the in Dark the same Ages. Way. In the same way. Fornicating with kings to enforce her doctrines. In the same way that Roman Catholic governments and powers, kings and queens, were the actual instruments of execution of heretics in the Inquisition. That That's right. The Dominicans and then later the Jesuits would torture the heretics, but then they would turn them over to the state for the state's power of execution. And then they, they would murder, execute, assassinate. Exactly. exactly. Now let's go back to that word harlots. I want to build a case on this. Uh, the word is is a plural word, right? So we know that that she's a harlot, but she's also a mom. And what do moms do? They have babies, right? And she, and, and the text says she's the mother of harlots. Now, harlots is a plural word showing that the mother is not the only harlot. She has babies. She has daughters, uh, daughter harlots. So now we have we have two here. We have the we have mom and the daughters, and this is very significant. And it tells me it tells me that um, the churches that came out of the mother in the Reformation, at some point they realign with mom. They go back to mom. They reconnect with mom. And because of that, God then uh, designates them as harlots as well. And, and, and those harlots, and here's a key point, Johnny, those harlots are Protestant churches, right? Protestant churches that started well. Paul said to the early uh, uh, Galatians, he said, you ran well, you started well, but, but what hindered you from obeying the truth? And so there was a there was a departure that went on among those early Galatians. The same thing has happened in history. There was a departure from early Christianity, which resulted in the mother in the mother. And then, as churches came out of the mother in the Protestant Reformation, then there was a departure, uh, and there had there has been a growing departure, especially of late, when more and more Protestant churches have accepted, as you mentioned, Jesuit theology. And they're promoting Jesuit theology, and they're realigning with the Catholic Church, uh, especially in the area of social issues. Uh, that's that's what's happening today. So, so my point is that the prophecy of Revelation 17 does not just pinpoint the mother alone, but the daughters are involved as well. The that's her vow, Pastor. That's that's old. her vow. In Isaiah 47, she says, I, I am, there is none beside me. I will never be a widow nor suffer loss of children. And this is echoed brilliantly in Revelation 18.7, uh, as much as she has no glorified problem. herself and lived in luxury. Uh, in her grief, she says, I am queen. I am not a widow. I will not see grief or loss. And the, I'll tell you, Pastor, once again, the, uh, the Pat Robertsons, the Billy Grahams, the, the uh, Jim Dobsons, the blood, the fifth seal of the martyrs who were tortured and murdered by the Catholic Church for being Christian, for loving Jesus Christ, for loving his word, they, they are the ones that cry out to Christ from under the altar. How long, O oh Lord, will we not have justice? It's coming. Yeah. Now, okay. Now, now, you're right. Now, let me just build my case here. I want to follow some real uh, simple and yet powerful thoughts. So, we know that the Roman Catholic Church, we know that Jesus has different symbols. We know the Catholic Church is symbolized by the horn, the fierce king, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast, and the woman. And now we have the woman with her her daughters in Revelation 17. And here's here's my point. It seems to me that just like we have this dual symbolism uh, concerning the mother and the daughters representing the Protestant churches that are becoming like the mother, it's the same thing with the beast that she rides, which also applies to the papal power, and yet she has 10 horns. And, and, and I'm going to build my case, Johnny, that just that just like the mother has daughters, which is the Protestant churches, so the beast, which 
uh, was, is not, and yet will come back representing the papal power, also has those 10 horns, which I'm going to build a case in just a minute, applies to the Protestant churches, just like the daughters are symbolized at the first part of, in Revelation 17, 5. So those same Protestant churches are symbolized as the horns. Now, in my book, uh, The Bloody Woman and the Seven-Headed Beast, you know, I discuss this whole chapter point by point. And when it gets to the ten horns, uh, I, I, when I wrote the book, I wasn't as clear on those ten horns as I am now. And I, and I mentioned that there's different interpretations of the ten horns. But the more I thought about it, the more I prayed about it, the more I've learned and how, how the Holy Spirit has been working with me, uh, things have gotten clearer and clearer and clearer. And I think, Johnny, this interview right now is the first time Praise that God. I've ever that I've ever uh, expressed this this view that I now have Praise uh, God. in in as definitive of a way, and because it is so clear to me now who those ten horns are. Amen. This is uh, Kenneth Copeland, James Robis Robison. Um, all the big mega church pastors here meeting with um, the Jesuit Pope Francis. Another example. Yeah, that's a perfect. Uh, and, and you know, it's interesting too when you look at Revelation 13, which we've discussed. We have the beast, the first beast from the sea, representing the papal power, and then we have the second beast, specifically representing uh, Protestant America that developed a constitution totally different from the papal power. Uh, the papal power was a church-state union. America is uh, a constitutional republic that has a uh, First Amendment that says that the Congress is not allowed to enforce religion, to pass a law. Institutional to religion. Institutional religion. That's the, that's the issue. Starting like a lamb and ending up like a dragon. That's right. So that's right. So when you get to, and then when you, when you keep on reading Revelation 13, what happens is the focus is Protestantism, Protestant America that loses its lamb-like character, speaks like a dragon, sets up an image of the Roman Catholic Church, and then enforces the mark of the Roman Catholic Church. So the final verses in Revelation 13, which as we've talked about before, perfectly parallel Revelation 17, again we find the final focus in chapter 13, the, the final verses, is what's happening to Protestantism. Protestantism is changing, it's, it's morphing into the likeness of Rome. And, and I see the same symbolism applying in Revelation 17 with those 10 horns. Now, now let's take a look at this verse. Very interesting verse, Johnny. A look at verse 12, Revelation 17, verse 12. Bring it up. And this is what really, this is what really hit me as I was studying this and thinking about this. Revelation 17, 12. It says, and the 10 horns which you saw, they are 10 kings which have not yet received a kingdom, but will receive authority as kings one hour with the beast. Now, let's just look at that and focus on that. So the 10 horns are 10 kings, but they have not yet received a kingdom. Now, now what does that imply? It implies that the 10 horns haven't yet aligned with the state. Because the ten horns have not yet received a kingdom, in other words, kingly power. So I believe this is talking about the daughters. This is talking about churches that are uh, connected to the papacy, but have not yet gone the full route. The full route of, of doing what, the, what mom did and aligning with state power. That's why it says that they have not yet received a, a kingdom, but they will receive power, which or authority as kings one hour with the beast. So during the final time, the final time they're going to get that kingdom, they're going to align with state governments. And thus they're going to show fully that they are the daughters of the mother and that they're doing exactly what mom did. Now look at the next verse. It says, uh, verse 13, it says, these have one mind. Let me wait till you get that up there. 
verse uh, 13, they have one mind. So they're working cooperatively and their power and authority. This is the power and authority of, of the daughters of Protestantism. They will give up to the beast. So there is their uh, support of Rome. There's their cooperation with Rome during during the final hours. Now it's and to me it just fits perfectly. Now when you keep reading, uh, it says in verse fourteen that what will they finally do? It says these will make war with the Lamb. So when the daughters. Uh, also represented as the ten horns, you know, different symbol, just like lion, lamb, just like little horn, beast, just like mother, daughters, so beast horns. The horns have no kingdom yet because they haven't aligned with the state yet, but for one hour, they'll do that. They'll support the beast. Uh, and when they finally do, the the conglomeration of these horns, it says they make, these shall make war with the lamb. And, and and Johnny, if this is right, what I'm saying, what this is, what this means in verse 14, these Protestant daughter churches, when they reconnect with Rome, what they're going to do when they when they re get state power, is that they are going to be making war against Jesus Christ. And here's the ultimate irony: you have Protestant churches that came out of Rome. Uh, because they saw her her apostasy and her traditions and her false doctrines and her persecutions, uh, and, and they they came out so they could focus on the Lamb, so they could show that salvation was through faith in Jesus Christ, through his atonement, his merits, his righteousness, his gospel, not through the works of Romanism. But in the final hours, they leave their Protestant heritage. They leave their roots. They leave the Bible. And now, as they align with the beast, they're turning and they're making war on the lamb, on Jesus. This is the ultimate irony. And, and, and as we know, the way they make war on the lamb is by making war on his people. Uh, like Jesus said, since you've done it, if you've done it to one of the least of these, you've done it to me. And when when Saul was persecuting the Christians, Jesus uh, arrested him, knocked him down on the road to Damascus, and he said, he said, why are you persecuting me? Well, uh, Saul wasn't really directly persecuting Jesus up in heaven, but he was persecuting his people. So when you persecute the people of God, you're persecuting. Jesus. And so when when uh, Revelation 17, 14 says he shall make war with the lamb, it's because he's making war on the people of the lamb who are not going along with the mother and the daughters and this unity and this, uh, this uh, reconnecting with state power and using force to uh, compel people to go along with the mark of the beast and to be just like you know, uh, European Catholicism during the time of the Inquisition, uh, the Waldenses and and the early reformers they opposed this and they were persecuted. And in the final times, uh, God's saints, the followers of the Lamb, will oppose this union of the mother and the daughters and the kings and all of this power and authority that's being brought to bear on them. They will stand up against this. So it's just and and the. This uh, conglomeration will be making war on them. And that's what verse 14 says. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him, those are his people, uh, are called and chosen and faithful. They are the faithful ones. They're the faithful remnant. There's the faithful final group that are standing up against this uh, this union where they all have one mind and in their mind, you know, their one mind is thinking, if we can get the whole world to follow this, it'll save humanity. It'll rescue humanity. But the reality is, it's destroying humanity. And there's one group of people that say, we're not going along with this. And they come against that group. And then Jesus stands with that group and overcomes all those apostate powers because he stands behind his people. 
I love that. And I, that's with me saying from my interpretation has been of, as of late that the 10 horns are Jesuit provincials. That also fits for me, uh, kings without kingdoms who act of one mind, regardless yeah. of the, of the take on this. It's absolutely fascinating that it is the 10 horns that lead the, the seven heads to turn on the great harlot. And it is the 10 horns that are the implement, the, the initiation of her destruction to tear her flesh and burn her with fire. Yeah. Now, now, now let's, let's go down to that verse, the verse that you just quoted. Uh, verse, let's do verse 16. We're almost at the end of the chapter here. It says that the 10 horns, 16, and the 10 horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot and will make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh and burn her down with fire. Now, this morning as I was reading my Bible, eating breakfast, I thought about that. And I thought, you know, here, here these 10 horns are. Uh, they support the beast. It says in verse Verse 13, they have one mind and they give their power and their strength to the beast. So in verse 13, they're giving all their, their power uh, in support of the beast. And then in verse 16, there's a complete reversal, total reversal. And now they're heating her. So what, what causes the shift when they're supporting her and now all of a sudden they're heating? Hating her. Uh, it seems to me that the shift is the plagues in Revelation 16. These plagues are falling upon Babylon, upon the mother, upon the daughters. Uh, ver the fifth plague falls upon the seat of the beast, darkness. And it says there that her, his kingdom is full of darkness. And when the churches that have been supporting the mother see the judgments of God falling upon the mother and upon them, then their eyes are open, Johnny. Then they realize that this mother that we have cuddled up with and we've gone to bed with and we've uh, promoted and supported, this woman has led us astray. She has led us away from the lamb, away from Jesus Christ. And just as much as they support her, now their eyes are open and they hate her. They hate this woman with, with everything in, in them because this woman has led them uh, to, to be lost. They're lost because of this woman, and so they hate her. This is the and, danger. And, you know, this is the message here. Absolutely. Um, and, and I still like the interpretation of these are Jesuit provincials because in the same way that young men are recruited to be both priests and especially Jesuit priests, they're recruited with Jesus Christ, serve Jesus Christ, promote the gospel. That is the society of Jesus. We live for Jesus. And then they become Jesuits. And then they go through the degrees. They rise through the ranks and they realize we are the enemies of Jesus. We are the allies. We are the, the, the agents of Satan. It's right in the Jesuit oath. I do further promise and declare that I will have no opinion of will of my own or any mental reservation, whatever, even as a corpse or cadaver, perendeach cadaver, but will unhesitatingly obey each and every command and I'll receive from my superiors to the, in the militia of the Pope of Jesus Christ. And I could easily simultaneously be right. You're not wrong. Simultaneously that these, oh. these are powerful Jesuits say, you know what? I'm done serving Satan. I, I enlisted to serve Jesus Christ and I'm going back to serving Jesus Christ. Regardless, these are the ones that it is the 10 horns that turn on the, well, I think the principle, the principle applies to all those that have thought they were serving God yes. in, in support of Rome. They realize uh, that they're that they're lost now. And just to clarify, I don't think at this point they have another chance. I don't think they have a second chance. All of a sudden, to come to Jesus, I think it's too late. I think they realize that they're 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 doomed forever uh, because the plagues are falling on them, and there's no hope. And that's why their hostility against the woman is so intense. I mean, we don't really realize the forcefulness of this verse where it says, "These shall hate." the whore. I mean, the hostility 
of those who have been deceived by the whore is so intense that they destroy her. It says they um, they they hate the whore and they shall make her desolate and naked and they shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. I mean, this is a final judgment. And it's kind of like, to me, it's a little bit like Judas. You know, the principle, Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss. And then when he realized what he had done, what did he do? He hung himself. He killed himself. His his insides came out. The dogs ate his guts. I mean, this is a very uh, sordid and graphic picture of the end of someone who was a a disciple of Jesus. All he had to do was repent. All he had to do was repent, and instead he was filled up with with, with self hatred and committed suicide. If he had just repented, he could have saved himself. So it's entirely possible what you're saying. You know, this is the danger uh, that brought out by Daniel's Daniel's revelation, Daniel's dream in chapter seven. the The three previous beasts were all. Uh, three and four were all military tyrannies. They controlled by putting a soldier on every street corner. But the fourth and final beast was terrible. It was unlike the previous three beasts. I feel that's because it is the transformation of military Rome into religious Rome. Military Rome had limitations on what it could control. Religious Rome has almost no limitation because it controls minds and hearts, and it uses the police and the soldiers of the invading nations. It doesn't need its own army. It uses the army and, and, and coercive force of the nations it has invaded. And here's the, here's the, here's the trap. Here's the trap. It gets its legitimacy. That's what we're saying. Rome gets her legitimacy by pretending to be Christian but she's not. And that is the trap. She receives her power by pretending to be Christian. And this is what you're talking about. People coming to the realization she's not Christian. She is anti-Christ. She hates Christ. Everything she does is criminal. That's right. That's right. And and people are lost because of her. And we're almost, yeah. Verse 17 says, uh, for God has put in their hearts. Verse 17 for God gave it into their hearts to do his mind. My, my Bible says God has put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree. Where is your verse there? Uh, to act in one mind to agree and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. So the words of God will be fulfilled. They're going to turn against the harlot. They're going to uh, hate her. They're going to destroy her. And... Um, you know, this is a very solemn prophecy of what the end result will be. And it's so it's so amazing, Johnny, that that those that are fighting against God and realigning with the papacy and then destroying her during the final time when their eyes are opened, uh, they're actually the instruments of judgment against her. You know, God is using them to implement judgments against the papal power through them. It's a little bit like how God used Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar was not a a godly man, but God used Nebuchadnezzar to bring judgment upon apostate Israel. He used Assyria to bring judgment upon apostate Israel. He used the Romans to bring judgment upon apostate Israel uh, during, you know, 70 AD when the, when the, Jewish war took place and the temple was burned to the ground. And now he's going to use uh, Protestantism, which has been deceived by the papal power. He's going to use them as his agents of execution against the papacy, along with the plagues that are going to be falling also in Revelation 16. So all of these verses have have, uh, many dimensions. They have a lot of depth. And they're really, they're a warning. Johnny, these verses are a warning not to be deceived by the papal power. Don't go to bed with Rome. Don't don't be part of the daughters of Babylon. Don't be part of the ten horns. Don't give your power and your strength to this uh, this organization because it's going to lead you to destruction. There's a great study in relation to 
how the Lord takes the very thing that was aimed, no weapon um, made against you shall prosper, takes the very thing that was meant to do you harm and turns it. Uh, Satan was going to have Pharaoh drown Moses, and instead Pharaoh and his armies get drowned. Uh, Saul was welled up with with, um, anger and jealousy, tried to uh, murder David with his own weapon, and instead Saul ended up falling on his own weapon. Uh, t- I still like I still like the uh, the Jesuits also in this in how they presented they gave such power to the great harlot, turned on her and were the instrument of her demise. Regardless, it's it's consistent what you're saying and it's consistent with what I'm saying. The very instrument that that was used that she used is the one that's going to be used against her. Yeah, and like I said, the principle applies that they they all realize they've been deceived and they hate the whore. Now, the last verse in verse 18, uh, last text in the sequence, uh, verse 18 says, and the woman which you saw is that great city having uh, a kingdom over the kings of the earth. My, my Bible says she reigns over the kings of the earth. And that can only be Rome, you know, the woman reigning over the kings of the earth. Uh, And that's what the Roman Catholic Church has done. It has reigned over the kings of the earth. It's done this, did this during the Dark Ages. And when her power is resurrected, when she comes out of the bottomless pit, before she goes into perdition, uh, she's going to be doing the same thing. She, She gets back to her pinnacle, like you mentioned in Revelation 18. She said, I sit a queen. I haven't lost my children. I'm not a widow. Uh, and I will see no sorrow. And that's her final boast before she goes down. And then it says, uh, her plagues will come in one day, death, mourning, and famine, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. And and all of this, this whole prophecy, uh, John, to me, the bottom line is that uh, we we cannot afford to be deceived by false religion. We cannot afford to be deceived by the mother or the daughters. Uh, if you are part of the daughters and you're watching this, you know, Get out. As Revelation 18 says, come out of her, my people. Don't be involved in this. Uh, And the ultimate goal of this whole prophecy is to focus our minds on the Lamb. We want to be followers of the Lamb, not just professed followers of the Lamb, like the mother and the daughters. There's a difference between being a professed follower of the Lamb and being a real follower of the Lamb. And that's what we need. We need to, uh, on the cross, that Roman cross, for all of our sins, Catholics, Protestants, mother, daughter, Jesuits, every single human being on this planet, Jesus uh, somehow loves us all. And he paid the price on the cross for our sins. And he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And his love is designed to break our hearts, melt our hearts, bring us to him, put us on our knees so that we give up our own will and our own ways and our own, uh, our own, you know, direction, which is against him and say, Lord, take over my life. You're, you're the Lord of my life. Take over my life. Put me back together. Remake me back in your image. Help me to follow you. And that's the only way that anybody can really find peace and be happy and be productive and, and, uh, have good relationships, you know, with our, with our families and with others is because Jesus and his love and his humility and his kindness, this is what's ruling our lives. Jesus never used force. He never forced people. The the mother forces, the daughters force, uh, the 10 horns will unite with state power and they will give their power and their strength to the beast. Uh, They use force, but Jesus doesn't use force. He's the lamb. Lambs are gentle. Uh, he, He calls us. He woos us. He said, make a choice to come follow me. I'm not going to force you. I'm not going to twist your arm. I'm not going to put you in a straight jacket. I'm going to give you the freedom. Do you want me or not? And that's really what the gospel is all about, that we we come to him because we want him. We see the value of the treasure uh, of the lamb who will, who is also a lion, who's going to win and rule and reign at the end uh, and throughout eternity but his it's his lamb like characters character qualities that draw us, and then it's his lion like qualities that will protect us and deliver us. 
Praise the Lord. So it's been a good study, Johnny. I appreciate the chance to share these things with you. It's always a blessing, Pastor. It's always a blessing. Um, We're going to have to do Revelation 18 next time because there's, it's, we're, we're, it's right out there. And part two is, you'll see it next time. Yeah. Uh, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her plagues. Revelation uh, 18.6, treat her exactly as she has treated you. Pay her back double for all she has done. Fill her cup with a drink twice as strong as she has prepared for you. Devastating, devastating judgments. It has nothing to do with flipping a switch, the magic of a Billy Graham altar call. It is an int- is a life of intimacy. This is why John the Revelator, John the Apostle, John the Beloved calls it a marriage. You need to be in intimacy from here on out to marry yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ every day, like a good, healthy marriage, in a relationship. There's no, like I said, there's no come in and, and, and do this magical formula and suddenly you're, you're good to go. You go right back to your life. No, it is a life-changing event, just like John 3, and it is a marriage. And you live your life with Jesus Christ for the rest of your life, and it changes you just like in, in uh, John chapter three and how Christ told Nicodemus, it is you, you are born again and you are changed and you walk with him for the rest of your life in a marriage. And if you haven't done that yet, clock's ticking, sands are running out. You need to do that now. Love you, Pastor. It's always a great opportunity to sit and, and chat with you. Um, let's do this again. <laughs> yeah, we'll do this again, Johnny, for sure. We'll go into Revelation 18. Amen. Uh, awesome. next, uh, next episode. Awesome. Yeah, thank you again. Praise the Lord. And I hope that all those that watch this will be blessed, will be driven to study their Bibles more closely, and will draw closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank Praise you, Lord. Name. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Pastor. Have a blessed day.